Today, we wrap up our series, The Smartest Man in the Room. We've been looking at the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, in particular, the writings of Solomon. We've already covered Proverbs. Then we covered Song of Songs last week. Today is Ecclesiastes. The subtitle of this message is Wisdom About Life's Ultimate Meaning. As we get started, let's just pray together. Father, this is your time. These are your people. You're already at work. I know that. And I know, God, that you're going to work among us today. You're going to challenge us with some things about what we really truly understand about life and then ultimately about what it's all about. So I ask right now that, God, you will just guide me as I share from the heart, as I share from your word, and that when it's all said and done, we will know that we've met with you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, a few years back, in just about any bookstore you go into, you could find stacks of the book, The Purpose Driven Life. Now, one of the reasons this book became so popular is because it tapped into this deep longing within all of us to find meaning. A few years later, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing people reading the book, Eat, Pray, Love. It, too, was a book about a woman who, after a nasty divorce, embarked on a quest to find meaning in her life. Leo Tolstoy. He wrote The War and Peace, that's that book, and what the Encyclopedia Britannica described it as one of the two or three greatest novels in world literature. But you may not also know that he wrote a book in 1879 called A Confession, which tells the story of his search for meaning and purpose in life. You see, as a child, Tolstoy rejected Christianity and left his university in search of pleasure. In Moscow and Petersburg, he drank heavily, he lived promiscuously, he gambled frequently. His ambition was to become someone wealthy and famous, but nothing satisfied him. Then in 1862, he married his loving wife. He had 13 children. He was surrounded by what appeared to be complete happiness. Yet one question haunted him to the verge of suicide, and it's this. Is there any meaning in my life which will not be annihilated by the inevitability of death which awaits me. That crisis triggered Tolstoy's conversion. He'd search for the answer in every field, including science and philosophy. And as he searched, he saw that people weren't really facing the real questions of life, like, where did I come from? Where am I going? And what is life really all about? Eventually, he found that the peasant people of Russia, they'd been able to answer this question through their faith in Jesus Christ. That's when Tolstoy finally realized that only in Jesus Christ do we find the answer. So get this. More than 3,000 years ago, the wealthiest man in the world went on a journey like Tolstoy's, like Rick Warren's, like Elizabeth Gilbert's. He wanted to know, what's it all about? What's the point? He was an intelligent man, highly respected, greatly admired. He had virtually unlimited influence and wealth, a leader of leaders, and his name was Solomon. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon asked the question, how can anyone discover the meaning of life? You know, at some point, every one of us is going to have to answer this question, why am I here and what's it all about? Ecclesiastes is a deliberate attempt to explore all the options to see if any of them provide the answers that we're looking for. Solomon is actually doing us a huge favor. He's conducting an experiment so we don't have to repeat it. We don't have to do it. But before we get into all of that, let's step back and let's get the bigger picture of Ecclesiastes. I call this first point, coming up empty. Here's how Ecclesiastes begins. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utter meaningless. Everything is meaningless. So the first question we need to ask and answer is, who is this teacher? Who is the teacher? So we learn from this verse that the teacher, son of David, is king in Jerusalem. Although there's been some debate, most Bible commentators agree that the writer of this book is King Solomon. The search, the word for teacher in the original Hebrew is Kohelet. Some Bibles even translate it preacher, but both teacher and preacher really miss the mark in terms of translation. The term Kohelet really means the one who gathers, assembles, or collects things. Because that's what the author of this book has done. He's gone on a quest. He searched the world over. He's gathered up and examined and collected all the many ways that people try to find meaning in life. So Kohelet, I think maybe a more accurate translation for this word would be the searcher or the seeker. Because the writer's not really preaching as much as he is sharing all the things that he's learned along the way. Which leads us to this question. Where has his search led him? 
Now, if you want to know what he discovered, he tells us right up front. In the verse we read just a moment ago, he said, meaningless, meaningless. Other translations say vanity of vanities because that's what he found. In other words, his search has led him to a lot of emptiness, futility, and dead ends. He went in search of life's ultimate meaning, and he came up empty-handed. He went to life asking the question, why, and came away with a handful of nothingness. So he concluded that there's nothing more empty than life itself. But let's take this a little further. The Hebrew word translated meaningless or vanity is the word havel, which doesn't have an exact equivalent in English. Havel literally means vapor, a breath, or wind in Hebrew. Think of it as a mere puff of air or the vapor off a cup of, cup of coffee or, or even a passing sigh. That's Havel. But the way it's used is to refer to something insubstantial that you really can't hold on to, something you can't figure out. Figuratively speaking, Havel refers to something that's empty of genuine gain or something that's fleeting or something that doesn't last or something you can't get your mind wrapped around. Idols and false gods in the Old Testament are often referred to as Havel. In fact, outside of the book of Ecclesiastes, nearly half of the occurrences of this word in the Old Testament are references to idols because they have no real substance to them. They, they can't accomplish anything for you. Another example of Havel is what we read in Proverbs 31.30, which says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Beauty is Havel. Now, that's not to say that beauty is meaningless or worthless. It just it has no substance. You have it for a while and it's gone. Even in this book, Ecclesiastes, we see another nuanced use of this word. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and 8, Solomon mentions life situations that don't make any sense at all. Like, why do good people get what the wicked deserve? And why do wicked people get what the good people deserve? Or why does a wicked person live out a long life of, life of blessing and good people have their life cut short? These are Havel situations, not because they're meaningless or fleeting, but because they just don't make any sense. So each of these nuances should be in our minds when we read meaningless in Ecclesiastes. Solomon has says that all of life really is Havel. Everything is like a vapor, a vapor you can't catch, a vapor you can't hold on to. Vanity of vanity, Solomon says. Havel Havelim in Hebrew, vapor of vapors. What does that mean? Well, it's like what I explained last week, like in King of Kings, which means the greatest of all kings, and Holy of Holies, which means the most holy place. So what does Havel of Havels mean? It means that the most Havel of all, the most vaporous of all vapors. Solomon says, that's what life is like. Can you believe it? I mean, the wisest man who ever lived, who loves God, the one who's seen it all, concludes that, the most, that life is really the most unsubstantial of all vapors. By the way, this is not just a passing thought or even a moment of discouragement in his life. Because at the end of this book, he repeats that same message. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. That's Ecclesiastes 12.8. So this is not Solomon's depression speaking. This is his thoughtful and steady conclusion about what life really is. Solomon wants us all to know that life is a vapor of vapors. It's insubstantial. It's impermanent and ultimately incomprehensible. Does that statement sound radical, even maybe a little irreverent to you? Let me point out that there's other scriptures that agree with this, like Psalm 39, verses 5 and 6. Behold, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches, and he does not know who will gather them. The psalmist says, I agree with Solomon. And, and by the way, it's not just the Old Testament, because James in the New Testament says this too. In chapter 4 of his book, he writes, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So make no mistake about it. Life is a vapor of vapors. It's true for those who don't know God, and it's true for those who do. We all live under the same sun in this vapor of vapor worlds. You can't escape this reality just because you're a Christian. Now, it's important for me to point out that God did not make the world a Havel world. That was not his original design. Genesis 1 and 2 stressed that God made a world, and it was very good. It had no futility to it. 
But when the first man and first woman chose to rebel against God and seek satisfaction apart from God, they plunged us and this world into the Havel state. Ecclesiastes forces us to face the brokenness of our present world, that there are many problems for which there are no easy answers. Solomon tells us this, he has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to the end. In other words, we've been given this longing to know eternal truth. We, we want to know the grand scheme of things, but no matter how hard we try, we can't see it. By the way, this is not an isolated thought. It's something that Solomon comes back to frequently in, this book, in his book, like in chapter 8, verse 17. He said, then I saw all that God had done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. Understand, Solomon is not being pessimistic. He's just being honest. It's true whether we want to admit it or not. There's always an eternal why that hangs over our lives. It's, it, it, we meet it at every turn, don't we? I mean, our hopes get shattered and we ask, why? I don't understand. How can this be a part of the plan? Our child gets badly injured in an accident. Our spouse gets cancer. A tornado destroys our home. Why? I don't understand. How can this be a part of the plan? A good person suffers and a scoundrel lies and cheats and comes out on top. Why? What's the sense in all of that? You and I, we're always looking for reasons. Why is the question that drives us? Everybody believes that there must be a reason. And the moment we think we finally got it all figured out, something else happens that doesn't fit into our nice, neat category or explanation, so we're forced to go on looking. Solomon finds himself quite frustrated by this search, so he writes, I applied my mind to, my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. Yet in spite of all the unanswered questions he has, he's still not given up. Even though his searches come up empty, he doesn't resign himself to despair or write off God. I'll admit, on the surface, the book of Ecclesiastes seems pessimistic. Solomon says, everything is meaningless. He says that five times. He says, this too is meaningless. He says that 12 times in this book. A similar thought is expressed in this phrase, how everything is just a chasing after wind. Solomon tells us that nine times. But even though this book seems to paint a pretty dark picture of life, Solomon also has some amazing things to say about life itself. He says, life is a gift from God. He says, tells us that life is to be enjoyed. And not just that, that injustices will be corrected and that God is in control. But the image Solomon says best describes life under the sun is being caught in a circle. Listen to this verse. He said, generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams come from, where they return again. What Solomon is talking about in these verses is the endless cycles of life. He says generations, they come and go. In other words, humanity is transient, but nature seems to be permanent. The human race passes on. It lives out its term and then it's gone, but the natural world remains. And Solomon is saying there's just something wrong with this. It, it's backwards. Uh, humankind, we ought to be permanent. Nature ought to be transient. There, there's something with, within us all that feels this very deeply. We feel violated. Just about the time we begin to learn the really important lessons of life, it's all over. And the next generation starts again from scratch. You know, I'm 62 years old, and I think I'm just now beginning to figure out and get some real traction in life. Certain things that have been a mystery to me are not really all that a mystery anymore. But by the way, the Bible admits there is something wrong with this picture. Human beings were made to last forever. Nature ought to be changing, but it is the other way around. This is the protest we feel in our spirit. Something is wrong that all of, us, all of this can suddenly be taken away from us, while the meaningless cycle of nature goes on and on. So Solomon looks at three things. First, he says there's the sun. The sun rises, then it sets. Over and over again, day after day, nature follows a circular pattern. Second, the winds blowing from the south and from the north. Over and over again, the winds travel around the world in a circular motion. 
And third, water is also in a circular cycle. The rivers pour into the sea. The sea is not full because evaporation takes place. Clouds pour out the rain. The rivers run again. Over and over again, nature is caught in a circular pattern. The question for us is this. If all things are circular and everything comes back to where it began, if the cycle remains unbroken, then why does our life even matter? Why does history seem to repeat itself in these patterns? Why is it the more things change, the more they stay the same? Why, when we want to express our frustration, do we say things like, I feel like I've been running around in circles all day? Or we say we're spinning our wheels, or life is like a treadmill. This is exactly what Solomon is talking about. It's the fights you have with your kid a dozen times when you tell them to clean their rooms, and they say, why do I have to clean my room? It's only going to get dirty again. Life seems like a never-ending circle. If that's all there is to life, then what's the point? Ecclesiastes surprises people, partly because it says things you don't expect to hear in the Bible, which also leads us to this. So much happens in life that we simply don't understand. Even though Solomon had everything that life could get, he had fame, he had family, fortune, wisdom, women, wealth, he was still despondent. He wrote, I hated life, and he also wrote, my heart began to despair. To really understand the book of Ecclesiastes, there's this phrase you need to understand. It's under the sun. It occurs some 28 times in the book. Life under the sun is life lived from a purely horizontal perspective, a life with no view of the next life, a life without God. And Solomon shows us how a life apart from God, a life under the sun that ignores what is above the sun, is a life full of disappointment and depression. Ecclesiastes emphasizes the human inability to find ultimate satisfaction and happiness in this world under the sun. If I try to find real meaning, value, or significance to life on purely human terms, human terms, I'm going to end up disappointed. Because if you're honest about life under the sun, you'll see what Solomon saw. The oppressed have no one to console them. He says that in chapter 4. That the poor are often forgotten. He talks about that in chapter 9. Workers gain little in return for all their work. That's in chapter 1, 3, and 5. The righteous are treated like the wicked. That's chapter 8. Fools are put in leadership positions. That's chapter 10. Hard times can come on us unexpectedly. That's chapter 9. And we can't know which investments will pay off and which ones won't. That's chapter 11. So much of what happens in our life, we simply don't understand. And Solomon wants us to face the fact that life has mysteries, that we're never going to figure everything out. Our days are filled with frustrations, and life seems like a riddle. So Solomon asked, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Now, that word gain means that which is left over. In other words, after a man has sucked dry all the immediate delight and joy and pleasure out of something, what's left over? What endures? What will remain that can feed the hunger for satisfaction? That's the real question. It's really the question we've always been asking. Is there anything that lasts? Is there anything that endures, that has staying power beyond this moment in time? If life is an endless circle, if life is often unfair, if I hunger for answers beyond what I know, is there anything at all which leaves me with a sense of satisfaction? Now, what Solomon had that we don't have is unlimited capacity to try everything. He was one of the richest men to ever live. There was nothing that held him back from going full tilt in his pursuit of whatever he wanted to do. But that's not the case with us. When we're not satisfied, we have the excuse kind of built in that we hold in the back of our mind, if only I had a little more, if only I made more money, if only I had the perfect partner, if only I could get that promotion, if only I could achieve this or do that, then that would be it. Then I'd finally be happy. Then I could finally quit this rat race, jump off this treadmill. I'd finally and fully be satisfied. You see, we have an explanation for the gap between our expectations and our achievement. We're just not there yet. But I can see it. All I have to do is make a little more money. Then I'll be happy. But you see, the problem we have that keeps us chasing after the wind is not a problem that Solomon had. Solomon didn't have the gap. He had everything he could ever want. Solomon had it all, and he still felt empty. And in the 3,000 years since this book was written, that truth is unchanged. I want you to listen to these gut-level confessions from some celebrities you probably know. Russell Brand said, I've been on the other side of the looking glass. It's worthless. It doesn't feed your soul. I still feel empty inside. Or how about this from Cameron Diaz? If you're looking for fame to define you, 
then you'll never be happy. You will always be searching for happiness. You will never find it in fame. This is from Jim Carrey. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Halle Berry sounds just like Solomon. Beauty, let me tell you something. Being thought of as a beautiful woman has spared me nothing in life. No heartache, no trouble. Love has been difficult. Beauty is essentially meaningless, and it's always transitory. I can't believe what people do to themselves to make themselves look beautiful. They still have that hole in their soul. Brad Pitt is no stranger to this phenomenon either. He said, the emphasis now is on success and personal gain. I'm sitting on it, and I'm telling you, that's not it. I'm the guy who's got everything. I know, but I'm telling you, once you've got everything, then you're just left with yourself. Or how about this from the musician, Eric Clapton? I was a millionaire. I had beautiful women in my life. I had cars, houses, and on a daily basis, I wanted to commit suicide. Solomon was a man of unlimited means that he leveraged to the max in his quest to find meaning and satisfaction in this life. I like the way Philip Ryken puts it. He says, wine, women, and song. The song of Ecclesi Solomon of Ecclesiastes had it all. Today, his face would be on the cover of Fortune magazine in the annual issue on the wealthiest men in the world. His home would be featured in a photo spread with Architectural Digest. The interior and the exterior, from the wine cellar to the lavish gardens, pop star stars would sing at his birthday party. Supermodels would dangle from his arms. So Solomon lived a better life than anyone who'd ever come before him and most who would ever follow. He partied hard. He pushed the limits. He denied himself nothing. And yet he still came up empty. Ironically, the harder we go after pleasure, the less pleasure we find. And just so that we keep this all in perspective, Riken makes another observation about Solomon. He said, generally speaking, we live in better homes than he did, with better furniture and climate control. We dine at a larger buffet. When we go to the grocery store, we can buy almost anything we want from anywhere in the world. We listen to a much wider variety of music, and as far as sex is concerned, the internet offers an endless supply of virtual partners, providing a vast harem for the imagination. I mean, it's true. Many of the luxuries that made his life exceptional are now the basic expectations of the middle class. In fact, we have things Solomon never had. We have air conditioning. We have international travel. We have access to advanced medical care. Not just life-saving treatment, but drugs that take away discomforts that previous generations took for granted in life. For entertainment, we, he had private singers, but we have iTunes, we have online streaming, we have televisions and tablets and smartphones. He never went to Disney World or Las Vegas or the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The opulence of Solomon's lifestyle is the American middle class that I belong to. So is his experience, so is his experience of disappointment. There's a book, it's called The Progress Paradox. The author, Greg Easterbrook, he described the many ways in which the average American life has improved vastly over the last 50 years or so. Most Americans today enjoy a quality of life that would have been unimaginable for even the wealthiest Americans 200 years ago. But in all this time, even with all this progress, happiness has not risen in tandem. In fact, Easterbrook observes this, clinical depression has been rising in eerie synchronization with rising prosperity roughly 10 times the diagnosed cases of 50 years ago. Ecclesiastes vividly describes this all-too-common symptom, depression and dissatisfaction with life. What we have delights us less and less, and the answer for this is twofold. We're impacted by two universal laws, the law of unfulfilled expectations and the law of diminishing returns. You see, when you finally get what you've always wanted, you discover it doesn't give you what you thought it was going to give you. That's the law of unfulfilled expectations. It's why athletes who've accomplished their goals after training and practicing for years are sometimes left feeling deflated and empty because they get to the place where they've always wanted to be and then they ask, is this all there is? I mean, I won the trophy. I got the first prize. I got the gold medal. Is this all there is to it? Where's the satisfaction I thought was going to be coming with this? The law of unfulfilled expectations is all about when you finally get what you've been craving, what you thought would satisfy, and you realize it's not everything you dreamed it would be. But there's also the law of diminishing returns. 
we may enjoy something and really take delight in something, but over time, the return we get from that something gets smaller and smaller. Sometimes we even get sick of what we once delighted in. It, it bores us, it exhausts us, it drains us, it wears on us. In the words of the great theologian Mick Jagger, I can't get no satisfaction. Ecclesiastes diagnoses this problem and reminds us of the hidden force behind those symptoms, and that's the problem of death. Listen to David Gibson describe death in Ecclesiastes. He said, death is the pin that bursts every bubble we might use to shield ourselves from the truth. Think of work and money and pleasure kind of like balloons. We fill them with our time, our energy, our resources, our hope. For a while, we watch them expand. From the outside, they look big, substantial, so much greater than when we started out. But inside, it's still only vapor. Death is the needle that shows us the truth, that it can all be taken away just like that. Without the perspective of Ecclesiastes, people might assume that they're dissatisfied because they haven't yet arrived. They still believe the key to their happiness lies in reaching those goals that they set for themselves, whatever those might be. So they'll medicate their symptoms by doubling down on work or on their buying or on their pleasure seeking. In other words, they'll keep blowing and blowing more air into the balloon. But the problem isn't what we haven't achieved. It isn't that we haven't arrived. The problem is where we're going. The problem is thinking that what fills those balloons is everything. What Solomon is telling us in chapter after chapter is don't waste your life in pursuit of what doesn't satisfy. And all that leads to this final thing, the hunger for the eternal and its satisfaction. So Solomon goes on this search to find ultimate meaning and satisfaction under the sun, and he comes up empty. His conclusion is life itself does not provide us with the key. So let's return to the verse that I read to you earlier in the message. God has also said eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. You see, even after his frustrating search, Solomon insists that the universe does make sense, that there is a plan and a purpose, and you and I have a part to play in that plan. But in the moment, we are often clueless as to what is happening and how it all fits into the bigger picture. I'm mean, let's face it, there's just countless things in our life that make us scratch our head and ask the question, why? There are times when the only thing I can do is just keep putting one foot in front of the other because I just want to get through some awfulness. The Christ followers know that bad stuff happened, just like Solomon said. The, the, the poor are forgotten. Good people are done wrong. And bad people have good stuff happen to them and investments tank. But we also know that God is working redemptively in our life, even with the bad stuff. You know, Paul reminds us of this in Romans. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This verse doesn't say that all things are good or even that all things are from God, but it says that God will take all things and work them toward our good. Even Christians can't comprehend every nuance of that plan. Christians can't explain everything that comes into our life, who's it from, what purpose it serves. Even though Ecclesiastes sounds like a Debbie Downer, honestly, it's not meant to leave us in despondency or despair. It's true. Life at times seems like a jigsaw puzzle with pieces that are missing. But Solomon goes beyond that. He gave us a realistic view of life, a view that admits problems and shortcomings, that recognizes inequities and uncertainties. But even in this broken world, there are a couple of things we can still count on. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but, but even Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, he actually considered Ecclesiastes to be a thoroughly optimistic book. In fact, he considered it one of the most optimistic in all the Bible because he said it clears away all the false paths so that we, that we might be tempted to take in order to make really clear this is the error, but this is the way to find the truth. So what are two things that Solomon tells us that I have to learn and able to enjoy life? Well, one thing is to learn to enjoy life as it comes. Look at this verse. So I commend the enjoyment of life. Because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him and his work all the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. And he says that several times in Ecclesiastes. This is so important, it's repeated six times. The point is, yes, there are questions and inequities. But are you going to allow them to keep you from enjoying what you have? 
Ray Stedman, the famous pastor, put it best. He said, isn't it strange that the more you run after life, panting after every pleasure, the less you find? But the more you take life as a gift from God's hand, responding in thankful gratitude for the delight of this moment, the more that seems to come to you. Solomon said, it's okay to be happy. A lot of people misunderstand the book of Ecclesiastes. They think it's a depressing sermon on the problem with pleasures, warning people to avoid anything in your life that might make you feel good. For example, Catholics urged Pope Clement VII to ban coffee. They called it the devil's beverage. After tasting coffee for the very first time, the Pope said, coffee is so delicious that it would be a sin to let only non-believers drink it. There's nothing wrong with pleasure. It's just a terrible goal to live for. Instead, we're to think of pleasures as bonuses or consolations that we learn to accept with gratitude. The things talked about in Ecclesiastes are not inherently bad. They're just passing away. And because of that, they can never provide a permanent basis for happiness or contentment or fulfillment. They're not bad things. They're just not a good foundation for life. Derek Kidner said it best when he said, what spoils the pleasures of life for us is our hunger to get out of them more than they can give. Solomon encourages people to find pleasure in the blessings of life, which we know are from God. But they do not, and they cannot ultimately satisfy. How many of us are missing out on today with the joys we actually do have in this moment, this present moment, the happiness we find there in the people who surround us, because we're so fixated on getting answers to questions we might never actually get answered? That's the risk we face in not finding our satisfaction in today, in what God has given, in the people that surround us know that we're somewhere else. We're chasing after a dream that we think is going to bring us all the happiness we've ever wanted and never quite gotten. Or else we're stuck in the past, tethered to some pain or some hurt that we can never quite figure out. Solomon is telling us to live today in the simple pleasures of what God has given you in this moment. You know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Happiness is like a cat. Now, I'm not saying all cats, but most cats. If you want it to come to you so you can hold it and pet it, it runs away. If you pursue it, it hides under the bed. So eventually, you give up trying to hold the cat, and you just start doing something else. And before you know it, that cat is, cat is wrapped around your ankles as you're in the kitchen. Happiness is like a cat. Pursue it. It'll always be beyond your reach. But when you let it come to you, while you engage in work and other activities that are meaningful to you, that's when happiness happens. And that's what Solomon is saying. You'll find your joy when you stop pursuing it as an end in itself. Viktor Frankl is a name you should know. He was a survivor of Auschwitz, a, a really well-known psychiatrist. He wrote this, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as a byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Happiness must happen. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. So what's, that's one thing. I mean, the key to a life well lived is enjoy today. Savor the moment. Thank God for all the gifts that come your way and that are in your life right now but never make them your aim. Don't make them your goal. Then Solomon has one more suggestion for us, and it's this. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. To fear God, like we learned in the message on Proverbs, is to stand in awe of him, to depend fully on him and not ourselves. We understand that God is God and we're not. The key to life is not found in life. The key to life is found in God. It's learning to center your life on him. This is something we learned about, like I say, in the first book that Solomon wrote as a young man, the book of Proverbs. The fear of God is not about being terrified of God, but in its purest forms can best be described as worship. It's to see him and know him as he actually is. There's so much in life that we can't control or comprehend. Left to ourselves, life becomes empty and frustrating. So Solomon tells us to find God in our daily life, that there is a divine plan, but often the individual steps in the plan are a mystery to me. And because I know there is a God in heaven who knows me and loves me, I can accept that whatever I'm going through, 
even in the midst of all the questions and doubt, I know that he ha is at work. You know, true confession here. Since open heart surgery five years ago, depression has been a much more common experience in my life. No one knows exactly why it happened. Some believe it may be the result of stopping the heart itself while the bypass is performed. I don't know. I'll likely never know why. But depression is far more common after open heart surgery in many cases. But all that to say, and some of you can relate to this, I, I struggle now more with discouragement and despondency. It's, it's easier for me to feel overwhelmed. Now, it used to be if situations challenged me or pushed against me, I would only rise. If someone told me I couldn't do something, I'd show them a dozen ways I could and I would. That's how I was wired up. That was my default. That was me, but it isn't me anymore, and that's okay. I don't long to go back to being that way. I don't like, I don't like feeling vulnerable the way I do right now, but feeling vulnerable only presses me deeper into Christ. Let me tell you something from the heart. I get Ecclesiastes. I get how vaporous life can be. I know what it's like to face situations on a regular basis for which there are no easy answers. But I also know who holds and cradles my life. I know who never gives up on me. I know who's there for me, no matter what the question, how deep the darkness, or how discouraged I might feel. The one I've served for over 50 years now, he's never let me down. Maybe you're going through an Ecclesiastes moment right now. Maybe you've been facing some real losses and setbacks and nagging questions for which there are no easy answers. Sadly, that's the nature of the world we live in. Most people are not going to be spared these kind of things in life. But once I accept that this is just the way life is, then I'm forced to ask the question, how will I live my life in light of that? Solomon reminds us to live life in the moment we're in right now. Then in the midst of all the problems and difficulties, don't forget the good things that surround you in this moment. Friends and family and small comforts, the kindness of strangers, and things that come to, into our life on a regular basis, but we sometimes fail to notice because we're so fixated on our problems. Then Solomon reminds us to keep God in his proper place. Know that he's with you. He cares for you. He holds you in his hands, and he works to take even the worst things that happen to you and use them for your good and your growth. In response to life's pain and life's challenges, he doesn't give us answers. He gives us himself. And if you put your trust in him, you'll find that he's enough. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for this ancient wisdom in this book. So many people, especially people who are hurting, who've been through hurts, who've been through abuse, who've been through pain, who've, who know what it's like, God, to, to face profound losses in life that left them reeling and with questions that remain unanswered to this day. This book has a lot to say to us about what life is like, about how difficult it can be, about how easy it is in the midst of life, and our disappointment even gets compounded because we think that life is all about what happens under the sun. And so we expend so much energy, so much time, so many of our resources blowing vapor into balloons only to find that those balloons can be punctured in a second and we can lose everything in a moment's time. And when that happens, God, we're just left and we're reeling because at that point we realize we've been living for all the wrong things. That, God, we've, we've gotten our eyes off of what this life is really meant to be. That, God, in the midst of the pain and the difficulty, the confusion, the challenges in life, that, God, you are sending your consolations our way. You're reminding us that you're with us, that you love us, and you've surrounded us by good people and kindness of strangers, and people that notice, and people who ask about how we're doing. And God, because of that, we're supposed to live in this moment and just be grateful that, God, we're reminded that we're not forgotten. And Lord, if we really want to get satisfaction, our satisfaction is not going to be found under the sun. Our satisfaction is what lies above the sun, the one who created the sun, the moon, and the stars. It lies in you. And so, God, help us to center our life and our thoughts around you, to know, God, that this life, which is a vapor of vapors, is soon passing, but life with you is never ending. That, God, this is a moment in time. It's a period in a long sentence, God, that will last for all eternity. Our lives will go on beyond this place. And, God, if we forget about the reality of the eternal, if we forget about who you are and what you promise, 
then God, we will be truly miserable people like Paul said, because our hope is all pinned to this life and this life alone. So God, free us from this perspective. Thank you, God, that Solomon, in taking this, this, this search, and he was denied no pleasure, no nothing that his heart desired. God, it was all available to him, and he found out it was vacuous, that it was empty, that life is a vapor of vapors, that if we want to find meaning, we have to find meaning in you. So God, if there's anyone here that's listening to me right now who took the time today to hear and tune into this message that doesn't know you in a personal relationship, help them with what trust and what faith they have in this moment to simply say, God, I don't understand it all, and there are many questions I have. But Lord, I know the answers are not found in this world, in this life. And God, if, if I can't find answers here, then maybe the answers lie beyond this place. Maybe it is, God, that I was made for something beside this world, that I was made for you, and that my heart will continue to be restless until it finds its home in you. So God, as best I know how, with what faith I have, I give my life to you. I'm asking you to do in, through, and for me what I can't do for myself. I'm, God, turning my life in your direction. And I want to follow you down this path. And I'm doing that not because I have the answers, but because I don't have them. I'm doing this because I believe, God, that there's hope in you. I believe, God, that you're reminding me that you've already surrounded my life with a lot of good things that I've been taking for granted. Help me, God, to express appreciation, to enjoy this moment that I have, because these are all good things from your hand. I thank you, God, for what you're teaching us all. I thank you, God, for where you're leading us. Help us, God, to stay in lockstep with the Spirit and follow you into that future that you have for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for being with us today. I hope you'll join us again next week and every week. Please know at any time you miss a message or you just want to check some of the subjects, go to our YouTube channel. You can search the YouTube channel itself. You can look for a ton of different topics that we've covered over the past several years, and you can hear a message of hope and a message that God, that God can use to really heal your life. So God bless you. I hope you have a great week.